I'm interested in human creation, the future of human creation, um, more specifically how digital tools will shape that future. It's because technology is human. We create technology and we create the experiences that we have with it. So one of my goals as a designer is to make sure that we create really intuitive, seamless experiences between us and our technology. So today I'm going to share with you a little bit about what my colleagues at Gravity Sketch and I are doing with uh, a 3D creation tool. But before I jump too far into that, let's, let's talk about 3D creation. Everything around us is 3D, from the chairs you're sitting in to, in, to this environment. Is, it's all been thought of and created by people like us. Yet 99% of all the objects around us are created by less than 1% of us. And that's something we want to shift. So before I go too deep into this, I want to take you guys back a little bit to where we're all familiar with creativity. So we all remember this. And this, this is one of my personal favorites, pasta on plate. And we stop remembering somewhere around here. And this is because it's probably the last thing that we were creating. So see, somewhere along the line, we stopped creating physical objects. That's a real shame because creativity is one of our strongest assets as human beings. I mean, think about the technology that we use every day. We only use a very small fraction of that. I mean, your smartphone can allow you to do some amazing things. And outside of our pockets and in our environments, our home environments, office environments, there's technology that can allow us to do some incredible things. It's asking for our imagination. The problem here is it's hard to get access to this technology, and maybe not in the means of coming in contact with a 3D printer, for example, but understanding how to interface with that technology. That's a real challenge. But we all have ideas, and more often than not, these ideas are 3D. For me, I have a chair at home. It's broken. I must have thought of half a dozen ways to fix this thing. And my toothbrush, I wish it just had a thicker handle. And many of you guys have those similar ideas. I don't know what it is. You guys have your own personal thing that you just wish you can change. But we don't do much with that. We, we just kind of compartmentalize that. And then we see something that someone's done, and we say, oh, you know what? I had that same problem. <laughs> but it only takes a very simple action to bring something like this into reality. You have to start that, ig that ignition. It could just be a simple sketch. You see, this is a very simple sketch, and that sparked the trend to then bring that, that object into reality. I see, the barrier here is that we, we feel that Perhaps our ideas are not worth sharing or even telling people about. And we fear that we don't understand the tools. So why even try to get involved if we are not going to be able to bring it to reality? I'm going to share one more example with you guys. This is one that we all know. James Dyson. The engineers and designers at Dyson use cardboard before they even get to this process of creating a, a well-resolved engineering feat that is, ends up living in your, in your closets or maybe you even get so showcase it because it's such a nice object to have in the house. But you see what happens is they just get that initial idea out of their head through this very rough, crude manner, and then they start to iterate on that until they can bring something really, really nice to the market, and, and, and they fully understand it at that point. And what we're trying to do is do that same thing for the 3D space and the digital creation. See, allowing you to really simply and intuitively bring an idea into reality. And maybe the barrier for some people is the fact that they are not so good at sketching. But now we allow you to think in 3D and actually represent your ideas in 3D. So those, I those things that we were doing as kids in our classroom, they weren't, uh, it was like really practice for visual communication. They weren't like visual communication between you and your teacher. This is visual communication between you and yourself. You see, getting out that first idea, you start to get inspired by that idea, and you enter this feedback loop. See, then you think about that idea, and you say, wait, there's three other ideas that, have, that I can work with here. And you start to filter those ideas, and you start to experiment, and eventually you start to feed that idea until you bring something really interesting uh, to life. And it's something that we're not doing so much anymore. Uh, perhaps designers and uh, architects do this quite often. That's how they bring some really fantastic things to life. But we all have that skill. We all have the skill to bring some of this uh, creative ideas and concepts into, into reality. But the tools, yeah, they do remain really challenging to use. 
and that's a big barrier for many people. Well, our habits are being changed by technology. Touch and gesture control is completely changing the way that we do productivity. Pretty much 50% of the work I do and many of you do a day can be done on our smart devices. And this is not very old trend. This is something that's very recent. We used to be working with our stations and our keyboards and mouse. And so bringing this into the creative space is something that we're really, really passionate about doing. You see, when we can move away from uh, drop-down menus and complexity, we can start to engage in a more, I guess, intuitive way, a more inclusive way, so everyone can get in involved. But we all don't think like designer or an engineer, and even within those segments, they don't think alike either. Some people think with their hands. They have to touch things to understand it. They have to rotate them and, and, and really try to grasp what's going on. Other people need to read a very detailed description of something. They need to break it down into its components. And this is where Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligence is really interesting for me. He states that we have several intelligence, from linguistics, mathematics, spatial, kinesthetics. For example, linguistics is what I'm using right now. I'm articulating my words to you guys so you guys can understand them. And kinesthetics are what our athletes use, and that's how they can use their body as tools. But yet, when you look at the digital tools for creation today, they're heavily based on our mathematical intelligence, we have to understand the logic of this software, and our linguistics. We have to be able to decode what each of the commands are telling us to do. And let's like, step outside of 3D creation now. <clears throat> Look in our schools. We gauge someone's intelligence based on their mathematical scores and their linguistic scores. And so this may be the very reason why so many of us stop creating. You see, if you don't know the tools, because the language is too complex or the logic is just not there and it's not the type of person you are, you're going to kind of back up off of it. I like to equate this to maybe someone that has light German education. Maybe they can, they can speak casually with someone, but then when you go to Germany and pick up a newspaper, it's going to be really hard to get the news. You're still going to resort to watching the BBC, right? And we want to just break that. We want to break this and change it completely. So we're taking technology and we're stripping back that interface. We're making it very easy, direct input, and to get the result that you want. You see, there's still a problem here. It's that a lot of the manufacturing relies on a certain type of input in order to get a certain output. And 3D printing is changing that. And actually, some of the new devices coming to the market with virtual reality is completely changing that. I mean, 3D creation no longer has to be physical, although we're free to make it physical now with our home 3D printing or even the services that are available. But it can also exist in the virtual space. Let's think about this. Minecraft. This is actually a very young game, and it has over 100 million users. And the primary thing that these people are doing, and, and actually the users range from young to old, and the primary thing that they're doing is they're creating in the virtual world. That's really powerful. That means that there was 100 million people just waiting for something to unlock their creativity. And we want to do this in the creative space. So what we've done is we have a hypothesis the tools are broken. How can we make a more intuitive tool? We've done some prototyping, and we've done some experimenting. And that's, we've taken it to the people that say, hey, I'm not creative, or I don't know how to sketch. And this is what they produce. People that have never created something in the digital environment create something in the digital environment and are actually able to bring it to life. And some of our key findings have been, in order to create an inclusive tool like this, you need to have three things. It has to be simple. It has to be immediate, and it has to be limited. And this is where Lego is a really brilliant example. It's quite simple. We all grasp the concept of Lego. It's immediate, one brick on top of the other, and it's limited. You can only stack in one direction. But some amazing things have been done with Lego, from MIT uh, science labs just to your children at home. So bringing this to the creative space is a, a big challenge, and it's, it's something that 
we're trying to do in a way that is going to be really inclusive, just like this Lego brick. But when we tested it outside of the students or even hobbyists, and we bring it into some of the extreme users, maybe someone that it's a bit not so obvious, but when we think about it, quite obvious, medical doctors, they work in 3D all the time. But their information is given to them in 2D. In fact, they report back to you in 2D, or using the linguistic intelligence, they tell you what's wrong with you. They were really excited by Gravity Sketch because now they can keep that information in 3D, and, and these doctors don't have time to be learning drop-down menus and all this language around these 3D platforms. And it's like when you create a tool, you, you think, okay, it's going to be a creative tool for creative people, but when you start to bring it to some users, you, you really don't know what that tool is going to do until you get it in the hands of people who dictate what it's going to do, and that's been something that's very inspiring to us. So when we look at the technology today that's coming to market now, as a team, we're looking at how can we make sure that these technologies include intuitive, creative experiences for everyone. Because creativity should not be left behind, and you guys should not be left behind in this digital revolution. We know that the next generation is not going to be learning with the keyboard and mouse, the tools of the 90s. Their creativity is going to flow free. They're not going to be fear, fearful of what someone may think of their idea. They're going to take it far beyond the pen and the paper. And that's what we, I want you guys to do today. Because I believe that every one of you guys has an imagination and the creativity to bring some really fantastic things to life. You may feel a bit uncomfortable with some of these tools, or your creative juices may have just dried up because you're out of practice. But the time for creativity is now. The technology is here. I look forward to seeing what you guys create. Thank you.